A Puerto Rico. 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 All right. How's everybody doing? This is uh, Dr. Sean Brown, a principal of EBC High School. And today we have the opportunity to interview another one of our amazing teachers. His name is Carlos Olivieri. And um, just so you guys know why we're doing what we're doing. And um, it's all about the children at EBC. And we want you guys to see examples of what you could become. But sometimes when you see these examples, you don't really know their stories. Um, and how they got to where they are. So I thought it was important that um, some of our teachers share their narratives and Carlos volunteered. He was the first person to say that he would love to talk about his history and how he um, got to this place. So I'm excited. Um, he, has a, he has a crazy story and some people don't like to share certain things, but Carlos is an open book and he's always about doing things for the kids. So welcome, Mr. Olivieri, how you doing? Dr. Brown, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I hope whoever's watching, I hope you get something out of it. I really do, I really do. So mostly everyone at the school knows me as Mr. O, and probably is because I have one of those difficult last names to pronounce. It's often heard Oliveri, Oliveri, but I actually have a really long name and it goes, Carlos Antonio Oliveri the second, but on paper is really junior. So okay. no, that's that's like you know fun little fact. Uh, born Bush in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Say well, that again. Let me ask you about that name, Carlos. Um, so, and I'll go to the other questions as well. So let me ask you: You are named after your dad. Yes, I am the second. Okay, and how does that feel? I like tradition. I think there's just something important to it. There was a sense of pride I grew up with because for some reason, I I felt how I internalized it was my father took pride in his name to the point that it needs to stay alive through me. So wow. I don't know, subconsciously, I think you carry that whether you're aware of it or not, you know, it was like, wow. but uh, it okay. definitely had an influence in terms of how I viewed myself and it helped me connect the dots as to how my father carried himself in life. And you're pretty close to dad still. Yes, it wasn't easy in the beginning and that's typical be between most father and son's relationships. I, it took me several years to really understand my father and his story and some stories I was not ready for. Mm. And so as, okay. as time has its way in your life, then you're at a place of maturity where you can really embrace the pain, the story, the journey, the everything, and just have a holistic picture of someone's journey. And it's, 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 you know, self-actualization is real in those moments. It just gives you perspective in life. So to yeah, anyone man. listening, any young kids, if your parents get under your skin, trust me, it'll all make sense later. Yeah. And the reason I ask that is because I'm named after my dad too. My middle name is Federico. And you know, you know, when, when that's a part of you and, and for the young guys listening, you might have your dad's name or probably your dad's last name and you don't have the best relationship with him. That name means something. And I just wanted to, to bring that up because it's important that we um, do a little research about it. And just like you, you know, there's some conversations I wasn't ready to have. And then when I had them, I said, oh, wow. You know, this right. hides to every story. So I know exactly right. what you're Let, talking about. Let's keep going. Um, so where were you born? Born and raised in Bushwick, Brooklyn, all Bushwick. my life. Oh Never my moved. Stood there. It's so, probably time I need to move, right? <laughs> so no, 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 no. Talk to us about being born and raised in Bushwick. How was that? So you probably hear sirens in the background, and how coincidental. Um, but growing up in Bushwick. During my teen years, we used to call it the wild, wild east. And that has more to do with the fact that 
life was really, really rough. Street, I mean, the streets were very dangerous. I think the high schools, I mean, all schools during our, our time of growing up was a reflection of what was going on in the streets. And it was extremely rough. Not a lot of people made it. And I, you know, I had to realize that I, I had a little bit of PTSD and I had to work some things out because growing up in a dangerous environment, you come really in tune with this, survive, this sense to survive and to do whatever it takes. Um, and that's good momentarily, but it's not good uh, practically moving forward. You have to, you know, life kind of teaches you to have to adjust. Well, would you say, well, now you're in Bushwick. Um, it's been, I don't know how many years. Would you say things are a little bit different in Bushwick or? Well, the same? yeah, I think that it's no secret that, um, it's no secret that Bushwick went through, some call it, you know, an identity crisis, others call it just gentrification. You know, I think it's safe to say every couple of decades, a neighborhood will, will probably experience a change in the population that kind of hangs out around. Like when I when I came into, when my family moved to Bushwick, it was pretty much dominated all by Italians. And then when we started really just kind of take, not taking over the neighborhood, but you know, um, affordable housing was accessible in Bushwick at the time. And yeah, okay. Bushwick became Spanish. And now with gentrification, we have such a strong influx of people from other states um, just coming into, into the neighborhood. And so it comes with its challenges, but I would like, you know, I, yeah, it comes with its challenges and it's really more how you, ta how you tackle it. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about school. Cause I know that you were an excellent student. You did everything right. Uh, you never got in any trouble. What was the first school that you went to? Whoa, no, actually it was quite, <laughs> it was quite an interesting um, roller coaster. I got accepted into a gifted and talent, talented school um, from transitioning from elementary to middle school, only to realize that I was in an environment, I switched from an environment where I was getting support in an elementary school. And I got thrown into a school where the expectation was that you had complete ownership of your education. And so that was a bit of a culture shock for me. Um, mm. In some classes I did well, in other classes like biology, I still had a really poor reading level and comprehension, comprehension was impossible because I just didn't have the command of the language, the, you know, the vocabulary, all of that was beyond my scope. And so I would sit there and I would reread something about six, seven times only to get stuck and feel demoralized. And it was only a matter of time till, they, till I got transferred back to a community school over at 162. Um, and although the transition there was great in terms of academics because the support was there and the confidence you know, the, I was surrounded by a staff that was a little bit more warm, patient, understanding, uh, friendly, and that's huge. Not to say that in the other school it wasn't, but there was really much more of a, I would say that they did a good job, at least for the staff that I came in across with, you know, it was kind of like lecturing, something you'd experience in college. And some families are good at cultivating that um, in their kids, but I was, the first one to really, you know, make the mark in terms of college, like in, in, in the family, like in making strides. Mm -hmm. So my family looked at school as, as the means for progress. Um, I couldn't really depend on them in terms of academic help because they themselves uh, were victim to a bad educational circumstance, you know, mm -hmm. and they have their own story. So I wasn't getting the support at home. And when I made the transition to middle school, the, the staff there had a much more friendly environment. The challenge was now I didn't know anyone in the school and it was pretty, it was still a hostile environment amongst the kids. Wow. So yeah, that was pretty funny. Yeah. So you got jumped school. in middle school. 
<laughs> I know, right? All yeah. through middle school. Now I can relate, man. I think yeah. I went to junior high school. I went to 275. And that's where I saw the most shootouts and the robberies and yeah. the switchblades in the mouth. I saw a lot of crazy stuff. And academics was just not, I wasn't interested. I was trying to get home safe. That was wow. my biggest goal every day is getting home safe. And you could probably relate to that stuff as well. Um, so what, I just wanted to add, middle school, I was 162. I ended up going to Cleveland, Bron, and Cleveland, Grover Cleveland High School. Really humongous school. And that was, you know, I went through a transition where it was just like, okay, going into my younger development, I get to be, practice being an adult. And only to realize with all this freedom, I had no responsibility, I had no discipline. And it wasn't until the 11th grade where the guidance counselor kind of got a hold of my family and said, listen, he's falling really behind. Um, you know, that's when things started to change. But in high school, I had some experiences in high school when you're ready to go through there that I think it, it might be important or, important for anyone in education to, to listen to. So whenever you're ready to go into that story, you let me know. Well, yeah, that, that was the next question is, you know, how was your experience in high school? And, you know, not just speaking, like you said, to the students, but also educators and parents, what are some things you experienced as, you know, a, you know, a, a Spanish kid from Bushwick that, you know, you feel like we don't talk about enough that we should, we should start talking a little bit more about an education right um so i'll start i'll start with the subjects the i enjoyed math at the time because i came across math teachers that just found a way to make the class fun you know whenever you see that happen in the classroom you kind of see that magic happen it's a really nice thing it's a beautiful thing to watch um one of the classes that i really struggled with um was English and it was not, be, I was able to read. I had a great command of reading. In middle school, I don't know if they did this for you, but they would make us always read out loud an entire book. And the funny thing, Bron, I, I was really good at articulating myself, but I was You froze a little bit. Class, but my writing was horrible, horrible, Brown. And it wasn't until I think the eleventh grade that I really got that I had a different change in my experience. Ninth and tenth grade, I had my experience was negative, and how I internalized it was negative. Um, I'm pretty sure the teacher meant well, but doing well was a different thing. And so, you know, no kid likes to, you know, get, get a piece of work back and there was nothing positive to say about it. It was just like failing Mark, this is what you didn't do. And how I internalized that was, I'm, I'm not, I'm no good at this. And so my confidence was shaken. I didn't think I was able to do it. Um, and writing was hard, but I was not aware of why writing was hard. And then in 11th grade, I had somebody who was a little bit more warm. They were friendly and they would really just focus. They would affirm a lot of the things that they saw that I was doing good and started slowly warming me up and building my confidence without me realizing it. Um, and then I just felt more encouraged to write more. Uh, but I thought that they were really smart in using circumstances where I had, I had something to draw from in my writing. Um, and it was, you know, I think oftentimes they use like personal experiences and they just keep asking questions to help you um, just put to pen what you went through or what you was, or how you felt just describing things. and. After that, um, I had a different outlook on ELA and I felt like, wow, okay, somebody actually believes in me and they think I can be better. And in my younger years of experience in high school, I just felt like 
I was, I don't I mean, I felt like I looked at the byproduct of a judgment. It was just like, okay, not good enough. You're obviously no good. Right. And I felt as if the teacher really didn't care. Mm. Well, you talked yeah. you talked about, and I'm noticing a constant message that you're saying is that for you, in order for you to do well academically, you needed a lot of positive reinforcement from your teachers and you needed to feel like they believed in you. Um, and that's what kind of carried you through in order to like do better in school. Is that what you're pretty much saying? I, I think it's safe to say I had a very uh, poor sense of uh, self-efficacy. Okay. I was, I, you know, I think, I think a lot of kids to most yeah. degree have that in some different ways. And those fragile areas, we just need someone to maybe build up our confidence or, yes. you know, just take mm -hmm. a, take a different approach. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, and, and you know, the same thing for me, it's just the feeling like, you know, that teacher believes in me or that staff member believes in me or that security guard believes in me. I just, you want to feel believed in. So, you know, our students are watching and we want you to know we believe in you. Um, this is the reason we're even doing this interview is because we want you to know that we feel some of the same things that you feel. Um, even now as adults, you want to feel believed in, you want to feel like someone has faith in you. But also we want to encourage you to know that there's going to be people in your life who don't believe in you. Right. And that's okay. Right. They don't believe on, in you because of their experiences and their own personal issues. And when you come across people like that, whether it's a teacher, a principal, or whoever it is, you have to just take what they say with a grain of salt and keep it moving because they're not necessarily in the business of building you up. That's not what they're trying to do. Um, so now you finish high school and you go into college. How did you become a teacher? Like, wh how did oh, that, man. like, when did you say, I want to go back into this place? Um, where I had so much negative experiences and I want to teach. Like, how did that happen? Um, so I'm a career changer, right? Uh, went straight into college. I'm, I'm not, I'm the late bloomer, okay? I'm not the ideal candidate that they went straight into college afterward and succeeded. I went straight to college uh, because I didn't really have any choice and my parents felt uh, that that was the next thing that I needed to do, but the harder thing, the harder thing for me to get a chance to do in high school was do. I wasn't really getting those. Support. Some of it was the school, and so going in, you kind of sign up for something that you're not, you don't really know what you're signing up for. Uh, you know, engineering, and then my experience going into Queens College was just like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Threat factor, okay, I'm gonna fail, time to withdraw. Because they were disappointed, but I needed about another two, I, I would say three years to really um, figure out what it is that I wanted to do. And then I ended up going into business, uh, worked in the corporate America, um, was making decent money. However, it wasn't aligned with what I, with what I really liked. It, over the, all the years, Brown, that I had been going to school, going to college, uh, um, with kids. And that, I didn't realize that. So I want to say maybe my early or mid thirties, but all of my twenties, while I was going to college, I was working at community-based organizations. Uh, I was working at group homes. I was working for non-secure detention facilities. You know, I was working for, you know, independent uh, uh, programs where they will help young adolescents that were at risk, um, really just kind of help them into like independent thinking and grooming them to be independent because they came out of some really hard situations. So there came a point where I was just like, business is cool, I get it, but it's not me. And it's just like, somebody was like, why don't you try your hand in teaching? And I was like, wow, that, you know what? That, sound, that sounds like it might really be cool. Like it, it hit me then that I, 
it might work because where most people be like, oh, I could never work in a school. Kids drive me crazy. It's like, I understand them. I get them. Yeah. It can't be so bad. It, yeah. I, I get it. You know, what you call chaos is like, oh, that's normal. It's not that serious. And I had been surrounded in so many environments where most people are running out of a room full of kids. And I was just running in and it was just like, oh, it, it's not as bad. And and I think when I got into teaching, I was just like, wow, this this is it. And I and I think there was a how do you call it? But it was refreshing because they, I was as a teacher, Brown, when I when I started in my first couple of years, I was I was forced to reflect off of all of the amazing educators that made a difference in my life. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was only right to honor them and to honor the work that they did, the, the influence that they had in my life. I felt I needed to do that in the classroom to honor them as well. Um, because what someone did for me, I experienced the goodness of that. I needed that. And now here I'm in a room full of kids needing the very thing that I know that I needed, that I received it. I didn't receive it from everyone. I received it from a few, but the few that gave it never left me. And so I was just like, you know what, let me take that and let every opportunity that I can be to give what I got when I was younger. Um, and I think that's the, I think, you know, if you're in teaching, you could be a great, you can know the command of an entire subject, but to get a kid to comprehend something on his own that you, or you can do, I don't know, you know, without turning this into like a philosophical scholarly debate, you know, I feel like that's really on the kid. You got to create, you got to create that environment around him. You got to create yeah. an environment where his inner processes naturally want to. Yeah. It is just so many intangibles, Brown. It's one of those things you either got it or not, or if you, you got to stay in an environment long enough to figure it out, you know? Yeah. And what I notice about you is like when you start talking about your interactions with the kids, you light up. <laughs> it's like you get excited just talking about the students yeah. and about the school. And that's, you know, it's a beautiful thing because those are the things that no one can teach you and no one can force you to have. And you've always been that way about the students. Um, I'll, I'll, you, I'll explain what that is, because, you know, some people be like you light up around kids. It's true. I do. I love kids. I do, too. I love what they I represent. I love working with them. They're innocent. Yeah. It's, they're pure, you know? Yeah. Now, are they, you know, can they be a pain? Absolutely. Can they act like minions? Of course. But they're they're young, they're pure, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out life, you know, like, yeah. the first, I think, yeah. I think for me, man, it's like, it's the same feeling of, I didn't have the best teachers growing up, but I had some really great teachers. Yeah. And the other thing is that I'm a kid at heart, you know what I'm saying? Like we like playing ball with the kids and, and making music with the key, with your um, studio that you created. Um, you love making films and documentaries. And um, it's just great to see how they grow and change and mature over time. And um, we have stories, I, I can't name names, but we have so many kids that were in gangs and, and kids who had children at a young age. And if you see them now, it's amazing. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a beautiful, fulfilling job. And, you know, for some of you guys that are watching, um, for, for the black, Latin, black and Latino males that are watching and you're thinking about going into education, I want to encourage you. Um, there's regular people like myself and, and Carlos that are here and we love what we do and it's not impossible. And I know you probably had some really bad experiences, but you can be that difference. You know, what I appreciate about Carlos also is that He's willing to challenge us, um, leadership specifically, when he feels something isn't going on that that should be happening. And because um, I know a lot of black and brown guys are like, yeah, I don't want to go into a school and have to deal with all of that, uh, the drama of a school building. There's some school buildings where there's a good dialogue that happens. So I definitely want to encourage you guys to do it as well. Um, last couple of minutes, I wanted to ask you, um, if you could say anything specifically to your people in Bushwick, the parents, the students, um, just people in the community, 
what would you want them to take away from your story, your challenges, your struggles? If you could say something to inspire them, uh, what would that thing be? Anything is possible. Now, out of respect, because I'm a person of faith, right? Was I a person of faith all my life? No. But I have a conviction, and I believe that this applies whether you are able, whether you are a person of faith or not. Um, you know, the 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 community of a community of believers would say that with God, all things are possible. And I came to realize the truth of that, yet not being a believer, but the power of belief. I grew up an insecure individual all my life, doubting myself, doubting myself, doubting myself. And for me, I had to come to a point where I needed to believe in myself and that I can do anything. The power of belief is monumental in the learning process. And that's what I think people need to understand. If you believe that you can, I'm just of the, I, I think that at least judging from my experience, I bought into a lie and I bought into so many lies growing up. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I started having the courage to believe something different to believe that I can or to have someone encourage me to believe something different from the lie that I that I bought into that I couldn't mm. you can and you can do anything you can do anything you want you that you know now I'm not saying everyone's gonna be the next LeBron James you know but what I'm saying is that there is nothing beyond your reach, but you will never be able to attain it unless you first go through the door of believing in yourself. And so that principle makes sense. Of course, it makes sense because it's part of my life story. Um, and I just have, I've looked at my personal life and I had to be grateful because it was just like, my life was very difficult and the only way it makes sense is because I, I kind of find comfort in putting my trust in something that transcends me. Because when I look at me, I see all my flaws mm -hmm. and I just see how much how much help I need. I'm in need of uh, by those by the community around me, whether it's a school community or a family community. But even in all of those things in the right community, people build each other up. And when they build each other up is because we believe that we can and we believe that we can accomplish great things. But if I can't believe that I can't do that, then I'll never achieve it. So believing is the hardest, but yet most freeing decision that you have to make. And, I, and I'll tell you one thing to the, to the kids in Bushwick, Brooklyn, anything is possible. Anything is possible. You commit yourself to anything and you can do it. But most people commit to something because they believe that they can. And so I'll leave you with that. The power of belief. Excellent. And for an educator, you know, are you building that belief in your students? Because everyone measures that differently. And I would hope that you take the time to know your students and to find ways to demonstrate to them that you genuinely care about their well-being and their success. And if they can believe that about you, then maybe they can believe for themselves that they can take on a task that seems unattainable. And I'll leave you with that. And, and I think that's the perfect way to leave it off. I'll add also for educational leaders and principals, you have to believe in your staff and they know when you don't, they know when you don't, you don't have faith in them. And um, for you, Carlos, and we get, you're going to let me do this part, okay? And you're not going to cut in. Um, I'm super proud of you. Thank you. Uh, we have a we we have a long history together. I've seen where you've come from, and what I like about you the most is your dedication to the community and to your children. 
we have gone above and beyond in so many different ways that we can't talk about here on camera to make sure that our kids were safe. Um, yeah. we, we put ourselves in danger at times to make sure that our children were safe. And you are a, a great representative for our children in Bushwick. You, you show them that things are possible. You, rode a, you, you ride a motorcycle, <laughs> you, you wear Jordans, you do all this different kind of stuff and you normalize um, Latino excellence. It's possible. Thank you. It's possible. And this is not the end of your story. This is just, I think you're midway through. You have a lot, a lot more to go. So thank you for interviewing with us and sharing your story. And I hope that this encourages our staff, our students, and our community to keep pushing forward. All right. This is uh, this was excellent. So thank you. And you have a great day. Thank you, Brown. Thank you, everybody. You take care.